Happy Friday, everybody! Congratulations, and if it's Saturday for you,、uh, happy early Saturday, I suppose. Today we're going to be talking a little bit about this book that I wrote. It's called Pocket Full of Dough. This is the first edition. I have the second edition here, but we're going to do things a little bit differently. Now, in case you're new to the channel, my name is Chris Doe, and welcome. And today we're going to be doing AMA, which stands for Ask Me Anything. But we're doing it a little different because I'm joined by my future pro family and one person in particular, Misty Gonzalez. And I'll be sharing a little bit from the book and opening it up to questions from the pro fam and community. I just want to let you guys know because it's been asked quite a bit. When's the new book coming out? In terms of the second edition, the first edition was sold out. And we also have Greg Gunn on the, the Zoom call with us today, and he was responsible for picking these colors, which I really do love. I mean, if I don't know what colors to pick, I'm gonna go to the color guy himself, and he picked this really brilliant—I don't know how to describe it—like a super intense hot pink and a really intense blue. So I think the colors really pop. And without further ado, I want to welcome the rest of my team and my family here, including Mark and Jonah, who's doing the editing. Misty, how are you doing today? I'm awesome. Thanks for asking. You certainly are awesome. <laughs> Now, Misty, for people who don't know who you are, can you give us an introduction? Sure. I'm Misty G, and、uh, I'm an environmental designer and a business culture of health strategist, and I'm also part of the Pro Fam, which I'm I'm grateful to be a part of, and、uh, that's how I got here. Yeah. Yes, you are, and I like seeing you in the light. You're you're kind of basking in the light. You look different today, but you say it's just because it's brighter in the room. Okay, so let's set up the context for why we're even having this conversation. I think you were a part of a different community, and you're like, hey, there's some questions. Maybe we should talk about the book. And so, why don't we just jump in? Sure. So,、um, I'm a moderator for the business fundamentals subgroup in Pro Group, and we've been doing. Or started to do Q and As for、uh, different authors that we find inspiring, and we want to know more. So、um, we some thoughts were shooting around about doing a Q and A with you about pocket full of dough, and so here we are. We made it happen. Yeah, we made it happen, and it just happened like I think in less than a week. You said let's go, and here we are. Yep. So what what should we talk about? And I also want to encourage、uh, people who are watching live with us on YouTube to go ahead and drop in comments, especially if you've read the book or you're curious about an idea. And I'll see if I can find a passage in the book that may or may not address it. But also for my pro fam who are on this call, I think there are 28 people on this, including myself. Feel free to join us in any any capacity that you want. This is a conversation. It's casual. It's casual Friday. I'm just thrilled that I made it. Right? We made it past this week. So. I'm in kind of wind down mode, preparing for the weekend. So where where do we begin, Misty? Well, my question is, what inspired you to write this book? Oh, okay. So what inspired me to write the book? I have to say that even the idea of writing a book is a super scary and daunting, and not one that I would normally initiate on my own. I think. Through the many videos that we've produced on YouTube, people have asked, like Christo, you need to write a book, or they would say this on Twitter. And eventually, I said, I said, yeah, I gave into the idea. Maybe I should write a book. And the way that I was going to write the book is a concept that I want to share with you guys, which is to pre-sell something so that you know there's demand for it. There are a lot of people who are going to tell you, oh, I love your shirt and your hat. Can you make me one? I'd love to buy it. And、then you go make two hundred of them, and they're like, "Hey, you want that shirt?" No, I was just giving you a compliment. And now you have inventory and things you don't know what to do with. So in the educational space, especially if you're thinking about authoring a course, doing a workshop, you should do a pre-sale. It's a concept that's very familiar to people who are in the space. So with the help of Greg Gunn and Min, I, I wrote a few sample pages, and then they built this Kickstarter campaign for me. And I think our goal, Greg, and Greg's on the call. If he can clarify for me, I think our goal was to sell twenty-five thousand dollars worth of books, because it was less than that. To me, at least, it's just not going to be worth it. I don't want to write a book for like ten people. It just doesn't make sense. And thankfully, I think within a few days, maybe the first week, we hit that twenty-five thousand dollar mark, and then we we did our stretch goals, which is like, I think fifty or sixty thousand, and then we hit that, and then I think we ultimately ended around seventy-five thousand dollars in sales, which was good news, bad news. People do want the book. The goodwill that I've been sharing and, and giving to people did earn some reciprocity and the love and appreciation. I really felt that. The bad news: I have to write a book,、Ugh. and it was very painful. 
and, and Greg is my editor. He was on top of me. He's like, Chris, where's the book? I can only stall for so long. And it was so painful to write this. And I'm glad it's done because I don't want to do that again for some time. What was the most enjoyable part of writing the book for you? Giving it to Greg to say, do something with this. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I told you before, but the graphics are particularly delightful. They really are. Oh, thank you. Uh, Min and I worked on it, and we we knew that the, the writing was going to be okay, but hopefully the design will make it better than okay. Above average is what we're striving for here. So we we would lean in on our strengths. So opposite every every page is an is a piece of design with typography and graphics to help illustrate the point. And they're like mini posters. And Misty, once having read the book, now understand why this is behind me because those are actually proof sheets from the printer. So this one is the proof sheet here. And this down here is actually a poster that we made using silkscreen inks. Oh, cool. Yeah. The stories are good too. It's very relatable. It's, I like your, your portions of the book where you talk about your personal experiences and how they relate to the stories that you're telling. It's, uh, it's really delightful to read. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, one of the other challenges that I had with writing the book is I, I wrote these kind of um, in, in different spurts. Uh, so three months into it, I felt like I was saying the same thing. And I had to ask Greg, Greg, make sure I'm not just repeating myself. Maybe I'm out of ideas because he had a target number of pages that we needed to hit uh, so that it would feel like it's substantive enough to, to justify even putting it into print in the first place. Mm -hmm. So once we went back and started editing, I realized that my ideas are overlapping. So maybe I only have like 10 things to say. And I'm just finding different ways to say it. I didn't notice. <laughs> it works. <laughs> yeah. There's a question in the chat from okay. from Iwana who's asking, how did you work through the pain? How did we work through the pain? I think when you make a commitment and, and uh, trust has been given to you, that is sometimes enough to keep you moving forward. And so we, we talk about this a lot as a, as a way to keep yourself motivated to make a public declaration of the things that you're going to do and tell your your most dearest, closest friends who are going to hold you accountable that this is what you do. I think this is one of the reasons why one aspect of traditional marriage works really well because you're you're pledging, you're making this promise, this eternal promise to, to love and to hold and to honor and to cherish one another till death do you, do you part in front of your, your spouse's family, uh, your best friends, the people you care the most about. And I think that's what helps you to get through the tough parts? Uh, anybody that's been married or in a in a serious, long-term committed relationship knows that there are points in which you're like, I don't know if this works. I, I'm, maybe there's an easier path. And choosing that easier path would make my life temporarily better. But sticking through it, figuring out how to solve those problems and those promises that you make actually make you a better person. So yeah. I don't think it's any different. Growth. It's growth, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Jonah is asking uh, me to record. Is that right, Jonah? Yeah, on Zoom. Okay, I'm going to re record it right now to the cloud. And we have a question okay. from Pixel Games on YouTube asking, okay. what, is the book, what is the book about? The What is the book about? That's really good. So I think this book is, uh, look at the printing on this, is a summary of the things that I've learned in my life. And so it's a distillation of a lot of different principles, and it's organized into seven chapters it talks about relationships creativity beliefs pricing sales and negotiation marketing and mindset i think initially when greg and i were talking we wanted to chop the book in half about creativity and business and it started to lean pretty heavily into business and mindset so it didn't feel quite right so we we chopped it into more smaller parts right so um, the things that you hear me talk about on social media on twitter on instagram and on youtube I've done the best to distill it into something that you can read in, in one page. So each lesson is contained to one page. And it was very, very difficult to do that. Some, some ideas are very simple and only required a few sentences and that didn't feel right. And some ideas were too long. So it's just through this process of pushing and pulling that we got it to, to be able to be communicated in one page. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not saying I achieved this, but I admire and respect writers who are able to use the fewest number of words to describe the most complicated ideas in the simplest way. 
And that was a real struggle because that's who I look up to. And I, I like this idea of the economy of words. Uh, as a late uh, bloomer to, to reading, uh, I was sharing with Misty before we went live, that I think I've read more books in the last two years than the previous 46 years combined. And I, I've noticed patterns. I notice people who are really amazing writers. Every word they put on the page counts. And then people who feel like they have to write a big book, they really only have maybe one or two concepts in the book and they just go over it again and again. And maybe that's what people like, but I'm a kind of person who likes big ideas, high level thinking, backed with some research, but I don't need 45 stories. I don't need 16 versions of your personal story that explain something. I get it and I get it quick. So I, I tried to write a book for somebody who, if they were in my position with a similar mindset and makeup, uh, but much younger, that they could pick this up and say, look, wow, okay, I can save myself from some future, future pain by just taking this advice to heart and incorporating it in my life and my business. There's a, a question in uh, in the Zoom chat from mm -hmm. Gage Mitchell. He's asking what your thoughts are on self-publishing versus a publisher or an agent. Very good question there. I think most people like to be published by a reputable publisher because it gives them confidence. It's um, a part of your credentials to say that I was published by HarperCollins or whatever Penguin Books because you've admired the authors and the publisher for the different books that they produce and it helps to validate who you are and you're accomplished. It's almost like saying, I graduated from X school. I was published by this publisher. So for a lot of people, it's a feather in their cap. Plus, a lot of people don't have the bandwidth to really design and figure out how to market their books, how to figure out distribution. But that's not the future way. The future way is to do it the hardest, most difficult way and to do everything on our own so that we can use it all as a learning experience. And there are some benefits and there are definitely some disadvantages to that. And I'll speak to some of them. <clears throat> Excuse me. The disadvantages, you're learning everything, everything's fresh and new and you're gonna make lots of mistakes. It's gonna take a really long time and you're trying to figure things out. And Greg has spent hours and hours researching how books are made, how they're sold, testing or vetting different print vendors, figuring out the price, price per unit, shipping costs, and, and just not knowing if this format is good or not. And that's all that we do on our own. And we, we, we've made mistakes and we continue to make mistakes, but it's all part of the growth process. The advantages are many fold. You control what you write. You control every aspect, including how much it costs to print. Now, as a book publisher, their main goal is to, to make a book that people want to buy and to make money. That's their main goal. Make a book that people want to buy that they'll make money on. So sometimes they may make decisions on the size, the quality of paper, the printing, the binding, all that kind of stuff. And that's not something that we wanted to do. So for example, this is the first edition here. So the colors are a little different for edition two. You'll notice that the colors are really brilliant. And that's because Greg and I, we chose PMS colors, Pantone matching colors, right? So that it's ink that they mix versus doing a CMYK print, which is an approximation of the color. Mixing inks costs more. And it almost came down to the eleventh hour where Greg said, Chris, this is a here here's the bid and we're we're gonna go to press. And I told him, No, 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 this is not a CMYK job. It has to be PMS. It changed the cost. We wanted to do a soft touch cover, which I like because it's this hybrid where it doesn't leave too many fingerprints. It's smooth to the touch. It feels it feels like really nice. It has a nice hand, as they say in the printing world. And then to do this foil stamp, this hot foil stamp, which gives you that that cool murder like black on black look right and that's what we want to do the other advantage here is money um, you a typical publisher might give you anywhere between 10 15 maybe 20 percent if you're like a known person and they keep the rest and they give you some books and it depends on your negotiations so you can't even have access to your own books which is kind of weird and those things kind of bug me so here's the deal for every book that we sell, we are basically making 100% of the profits, meaning we get to keep that. We could use that to invest in other things, to build more classes, to write the second book, or to do whatever it is that we want. So you can say that you could, you'd could you have to sell, I guess, if you're getting 10%, one-tenth of the books that's sold through a publisher and make the exact same amount of money. Hmm. 
let's put this in perspective. We had Michael Bungay Stanier on our show. He wrote the book, The Coaching Habit. And he told me he sold 800,000 copies of that book. And he self-published. So let's pretend for a minute he made $10 per book. Let's just pretend. Jeez. <laughs> you do the math. You add basically a zero to that number, 800,000. That would be, mean he would have um, $8 million from writing a book. And I think that's wonderful because as a person who spends time creating ideas to help people, it's nice to see authors uh, and teachers really, I think Michael's a teacher, to make that kind of money. You, like you could work in universities and, and public schools all your life and not even come close to that kind of money. And if we say like teachers and doctors are, are the most valuable people of our society, especially teachers, why isn't what they make equal to the contributions that they give? And we should reward those people. And luckily for Michael, he published himself. And he told me nobody wanted to publish a book. It's the same story. Nobody wanted to publish my book, so he did it himself. Um, Daniel de Jesus is asking, how did you come up with the title? Oh, good question. Um, I'll tell you a little personal story here. The personal story is I, I, I'm a first generation refugee immigrant to this country. English is my second language. I had a hard time fitting in. And the issues that we are talking about today, about equality, inclusion, uh, in terms of the Black Lives Matter movement, those are things I felt as a foreigner coming to this country. And I was grateful to be uh, in, in, a, in the land of opportunity of, of milk and honey, if you will. But I, I was treated for most of my life as an outsider. And it created uh, schisms in my own, uh, my own identity. I struggled with, um, am, I, am I good enough? Do I belong here? Why do I always feel like an outsider? <clears throat> I always feel like an outsider and I never fit in. So there was some, some self-hate in there and I was really kind of embarrassed to be a Vietnamese American. I, I wanted to be like everybody else because I was tired of people treating me differently, uh, pushing me around and and other things, things to get violent too. So I, I just want to put that out there. So it was through a long process of learning to love who I am, to love my own culture, my own language, my own identity that I found myself. And so today I have this name Doe, which before I would hide from because everybody that was in from primary school through junior high was like, what, name, what kind of name is Doe? And they would figure out, especially the boys, figure out very creative ways to, to make fun of me. And it, it hurt. Emotionally, I was not so strong enough at that point to deal with that. So today I get to embrace my name, to embrace my culture and who I am. And so it is a pocket full of Doe. It's like, you want to have some money in your pocket? <laughs> Read yeah. The book. That's hey, your it. Pocket full of dough. Your name sounds like money. How can that be a bad yeah. thing? Yeah. You know, and then <laughs> my, my friend, Mark Manatsala, uh, who um who who asked me is he's a he's a funny guy, so he's like, What's the greatest nation on earth? I'm like, I don't know. He's like, Donation. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, so so there's like so many like it, like here's your daily dose. And there's like so many creative ways that you can go with this. So the opportunities for the second book are, are endless. I wish it were easier to come up uh, with the rest of the content than the titles for the book, but that's it. So we knew it needed to be small. We knew, it, we knew that it needed to be compact and hopefully to give value. And from the people who've read the book, who've sent, who were kind enough to support us on the Kickstarter, who were patient enough to deal with our shenanigans, they have sent me messages online in, through DMs saying, how, how they felt like the book is really powerful, how it's helped them. I won't name any names, but sometimes people even go through states of depression and anxiety. And they tell me, they just go back and reread chapters and it helps them to get recentered. And I'm just like, wow, this little book that did it for you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with me. Awesome. Um, let's see. Holy cow. Have... Hold on, hold on. I have to say this. Chris H on YouTube, thank you very much for doing the super chat. He just dropped a hundred bucks on us. So I just want to read this message real quick. Chris, I really appreciate that. So he said he spent five years uh, at frustrating nine to five job in the defense in defense before he found the future. He knew that he could offer something more on his own, took the risk and negotiate a value-based contract to create an innovative virtual tool for a home construction company, tripled his income. Way to go, Chris. Ooh, and, awesome. and, and added free time to his life. What a win. This is what we're talking about. Happy Friday to you, Chris. Thank you. 
Okay, go ahead, Misty. I'm sorry. Sure. No need to be sorry. That's an awesome like, story. Glad to hear it. Rowena is asking uh, overall how long it takes to how long did it take you to finish the book from writing and design and before being ready to publish. <laughs> Greg Gunn, do you have your mic ready? I want you to answer this question because I'm going to lie. I want you to tell the truth. Okay. Ahead, well, why don't you start with your lie and then I'll, I'll correct. <laughs> I think it took like nine months. Is that about right? I, Maybe. I would, I would, yeah, I would, I would probably add, <laughs> add a month to that. Well, really? Okay. I thought I was overshooting there with nine months. I was going to say four months. See, so that so, was going to be the lie. I don't know when exactly you started. The, the Kickstarter launched in December of 2018. Yeah. yeah. So that, that was a while ago. But, you know, to, to actually produce the books and then get them um, in our office, that was probably three months alone. Um, and I think we started mailing books out in late late 2019 so let's just say this for the record for the record everybody that is a supporter who gave us money for for kickstarter to do this book you have the patience of an angel of a saint so thank you very much i know that greg had to field his many shares of complaints like what the heck this is a scam kind of thing i apologize it's not greg's fault greg's a good guy he's not a scammer it's me uh, you're writing something is scary. I have to tell you, I don't know why, but when I write a tweet, when I make something for LinkedIn or when I make a video for YouTube, I just feel like it's very ephemeral. It's here and it's gone, but we know that's not true because it lives on forever. But when it comes to a book, I don't know if it's the stature, the permanence of it, that there's physical copies and you've hurt trees to make something that I don't want it to be just landfill or to help even out a table. But if that's the case, then use the book for that purpose. That's scary to put it in print. And I was scared. That makes total sense. You know, the, the poetry book that I wrote, it's pretty short. It took me six months to finish that. Yeah, <laughs> I couldn't it, believe it. <laughs> I feel that. I feel that right now for sure. Yeah. You know um, what we should do, uh -huh. Misty? Uh, yeah, uh, I, I think you're doing a great job, but I also wanted to to have P pro family. They know how to do this. Just unmute yourself. So Jump maybe in, Missy, yeah. you can message them like, hey, why don't you speak? Or maybe okay. you guys raise your digital hand so that there's some order to this. So it's not like 10 people saying the same thing at once. But I want it to be conversational. Uh, this is AMA. Uh, this is a hybrid AMA pro call. So let's just do it like the way we normally do it. Okay, there we are. We have our first hand raised. So and no surprise there. It's going to be Matthew. Matthew. Bring yourself online. Hey, Chris, can you hear me okay? Yeah, loud and clear, man. Cool. Well, I've got my copy of Pocket Full of Do version Yay! one with me here. Um, just wanted to say I don't have many books, but um, it's really nice to have, like, when I think of this, I think of, like, a pocket full of your wisdom with mm. me. So, like, mm. it's small enough it can go with me anywhere. And I also think of the word dough as, like, almost like a starter dough for many you know, recipes to come, like it lasts, oh. the, lasts through the time. So it's very referential. And as somebody who can't just read straight through something, it's very accessible for someone like me. So thank you. Thanks for doing that. Thanks for sharing. Uh, first of all, thanks for supporting us. And thanks for that testimony. I love it. If you don't have any many books, that means even more. I have many books. I like I just bought like eight books. that just came in yesterday. So I, I, I love books. Uh, they make me feel smarter. Even when I don't read them, they make me feel smarter. So thanks for supporting us. All right. Uh, Missy, maybe you can pick up. Oh, I see real hands being raised now. So is it Meralda? Meralda, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. I just want to ask you, Chris, uh, what's the chapter you enjoyed writing the most and which was, was the most difficult for you? Okay. Um, so let me answer this in a couple of ways. The pricing business negotiation stuff was the easiest for me to write. It's the stuff that I talk about the most. So that, that was just a matter of like, how much do I want to say and can we edit it down to one page? The part that I enjoyed the most in writing uh, is what it begins with and how the book ends. And and if I can share that with you, I'll just read a little bit of it, okay? And the reason why I enjoy it the most, and uh, well, I'll tell you why after I read it. Okay, so I'm not like some expert book reader here, so I'm going to stumble. This is the thing I hated doing in, in, in high school. So here we go. I stand on a bridge between the life I have 
and the life I'm working toward. Every day, I gain clarity over what my goals are, take the steps that are necessary, and forgive myself when I mess up. On my journey, I try to help as many people as possible while doing no harm to myself or others. And that's just kind of trying to help frame things. And it's a message to myself, but I know that when I tweeted something out like that, that it touched people. And my goal is not just to write something that is cold, hard facts, because a lot of people can do that much better than I can, researchers especially, but to inject a little bit of humanity, compassion, to make somebody feel something. And if I've done that, if you read a book and you feel something and it touches some part of your body and emotion, then I think I've done a good thing. And and then there's closing thoughts and the closing thoughts are very similar too. But it's it's just to kind of help you frame um, and, and get your mind in the right space. And you could just read that and stop and think about that and reflect. As, as many people have told me before, they, they said that this is not a book you just read from cover to cover. You read, you reflect, you contemplate, you think about it, and you find ways to apply it to what you're doing. And if they're doing that, then they're utilizing the book to its fullest. Quick question here from YouTube. They're asking, how do I get a copy of the book? Uh, we're working really hard on figuring this out. Like I said, we make a lot of mistakes. We have now actually printed 10,000 books as the second edition. Uh, first edition is sold out, so you can't get those anymore. But second edition, you can get and you, you will be able to get once we resolve this thing with Amazon. This time around, we're, we're, we're leaning on Amazon to do all our fulfillment, but they have certain rules and they're very rigid. And we made a mistake about the barcode and it's creating all kinds of problems for us. So hopefully very soon, at least in North America, America, Canada, maybe Mexico too, I'm not sure, we can get this to your in your hot little hands. After we figure that out, we're going to go to Amazon Europe, I believe. And thankfully, we have friends in the Philippines, in Sweden, Annalie, I'm talking about you, and a couple other places where they're going to help us to distribute the books. So the theory is I would send a box of books to, to other countries where they can then uh, help me fulfill the orders. And that's a big ask because that's no fun to do. But that's the only way we can get these books out. We've had a lot of problems with international shipping, and I, d I don't know what else to do. We, we're we not familiar with all the postal addresses, so what you give us, if it's not 100% accurate, what happens is they, they ship it, and they try a couple times to give it to you. If it's the wrong address, it's, we're screwed. And if you don't receive it, eventually they send it back to us. And now you don't get a book, so you're upset. We're upset because we have a book that needs a home, and we spent the money to ship it to you, and we try again, and it's like, now we've spent more money on shipping the book than we have in terms of the money we could have made on the book. So we don't want to do that again. It's super frustrating. I'll give you an example. I was in Amsterdam. I brought six books with me with packages that my, my team, my wife, has prepared for me to ship out. I'm in, an, in a post office or one of those shipping stores, fill it out, pay the shipping. I go back to L.A. A couple of weeks later, four of the books are back here in our office. I'm like, what did just what just happened there? So that's why we need help. We need help with facilitating that because some local person will be like, yeah, no, this this, this address is transposed. It's not right. This is not going to go anywhere. And we wouldn't know that. So there you have it. Okay. Okay. Nathan, Nathan do you want to jump in with, the, with your question? Yeah. You all hear me? Yeah, we hear you. You're a little low, though. I'm a little low. Yeah, can there, you hear me? Fine. You hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah. We All hear right, you. Good. Go ahead. So this is this is somewhat related to something you just said. Um, okay. In terms of recording the audio book, um, how was that? Did you just actually read the book itself? Did you do a Gary Vee style and just say, I'll just say what I want off of memory? Um, what were oh, some wow. errors about that that tripped you up? I'm just curious about the whole audio book recording process because I know you have all the equipment. So Yes, we have the gear. <laughs> we have no shortage of gear. We, we have shortage of talent and ambition sometimes, but there's no shortage of gear here. Reading the audiobook was actually really tough and it was exhausting to do. And then I realized how lame of a writer I am because when I was reading the words and I asked Greg, Greg, do I need to read the words literally like the way it was written? He's like, preferably, yeah, that's what you do. And then I read it. I'm like, this sounds terrible. What, what monkey wrote this book? Oh, this one. And it was, it, was, it was awful. Like, I don't want to finish it. And it took a couple of recordings to get us through the whole thing. And it's funny, like, when you read your own words, it's like, I can't even read it, like, without mispronouncing words. And 
and, and getting the tone right. But eventually we finished it and we got it out there because it was part of the Kickstarter project, right? We had to do it. There was no way I could get out of it. But funnily enough, uh, or funny enough, uh, I was having lunch with Marty Newmeyer, and this was right after we had recorded uh, like what is branding episode, and we're having sushi and we're cha- talking, and he's like, and he's a perfectionist. You have to understand th- something about Marty. He's a perfectionist. He's a designer all the way through, and he wanted to get the right recording. And he said that when he read his first book, it changed the way he wrote. He says that. You know what? He gave me some advice. He's like, Chris, if it doesn't sound right in your mouth, just change the words. Nobody is literally holding the book and comparing it, and it's okay. You can change the phrasing. So thank you, Marty, for that tip. And he said the second thing is, after that, he's like he never wanted to write a book the the, the old way anymore. He wanted to write the book and read it out loud to make sure it sounded right, and that's the way that you're supposed to write a book. So that was a really helpful tip for me from somebody who is pretty prolific at writing and capturing his thoughts and somebody I look up to in terms of uh, the, that economy of words I was mentioning earlier. So it's a really good tip. So if you want to be a better writer, speak it out and then write that down and then clean it up. And that's one way. Or write with the intention of reading it out loud. I think it changes the way you write and it, it flows much better. Hmm, good advice. So I'm taking it. <laughs> Me too. Uh, Gage Mitchell is asking what the barcode challenge was so that as we're writing our <clears throat> knowledge products or our books that we can avoid the snags. Yeah. So here's the deal. We're, we're not quite sure yet how this happened. So I'm going to make up a story and then Greg can correct me if I'm wrong. You notice here, there's a difference here. So I have the two books and I'm trying to stack them up here. You'll see that the second book is wider than the first book and a little bit taller. That's because we realized with the thickness of the book and the size, it was it was harder to split open and hold open so you can read the full spread. So we were able to use that extra space to increase the margins here. So that's one thing you need to keep into consideration and when you're looking at your book to make sure that it opens up nicely and, and fits in your hand well. So if you study a couple of books that you like, just look at their margins. They're pretty generous and you need to, to kind of be mindful of that. Okay, the barcode issue is this, is we knew potentially we were going to sell this on Amazon before we knew we were going to sell it on Amazon. So we needed to get an Amazon barcode. So you go through the system, it generates a unique thing, a unique code. I believe this is like your fingerprint in the book world. This is really critical or your social security number. And then we needed to generate this months ahead of like finishing the book and the design. And we forgot about it. So that barcode sat there with the wrong description and everything. So sitting in Amazon system waiting for books. And then once we got the books in, I'm like, Greg, let's get this going. So we immediately pack up a bunch of books, send it to Amazon. <clears throat> the barcode matches, but the description is wrong or something is jacked at this point. So it says they're in stock, an a ebook version. And, and I told Greg, when did we sell an ebook version on Amazon? We've not done that. Uh, so that opened up a whole can of worms. So we're still trying to work through that. Uh, hopefully there is some flexibility here, but I can imagine Amazon selling a gazillion books like a day that they don't have time to deal with like little people like us. So it's been very difficult to, hey, can we just update the description and get this to work? Because the last thing we want to do is to print a sticker and slap it on. Can you imagine doing that? The amount of paper and materials we're wasting and the labor, opening up all the books, slapping those labels on. Oh, I I don't want to deal with that. Who can blame you? Is that the is that second edition the Amazon printed version? Did the, did Amazon print that? No, no, we we don't use Amazon printing. Same printer from the first uh-huh. printer. Same, uh, what is that called? Soft touch paper. Same hot foil stamp paper. The only thing is different. It's wider and the colors are different. PMS colors, Pantone colors. We we don't want to use uh, Amazon on demand printing. I've not had great experiences with that because they're they're just not high quality. Just my opinion. They will get there, but they're not right now. That's good to know. Thank you. Thanks for asking that. Because yeah. everybody's like, dude, he's cheaping out this time. Uh, I want to, do you want to jump in with your question? Yes, but I'm nervous. <laughs> okay. Don't be nervous. You do this I, all I, the time. I, You're doing great. 
Yeah, but this is, you know, life. <laughs> okay, so you talk about exposing yourself to new things as much as possible. And I have to tell you a little story so that it makes sense why I'm asking. <laughs> I uh, uh, keep having nightmares about not finishing or forgetting about things that would help me complete my work. <laughs> And then I go and Google um, fear of forgetting things. <laughs> and then it turns out that it's okay to, to forget things. But at the same time, uh, learning new things and exposing yourself to new environments and so on will cement what you learn way better. And I entered the, the pro group seven months ago and it's been a lot of failure and a lot of new and it it helped me deal with the fact that it's okay to uh forget some things and then to to have the insight that if you expose yourself to these new things you're gonna be able to uh have them in your brain for a lot longer time and draw from them and make a lot more connections and i wanted you to i wanted you to <laughs> to let me know why you advocate exposing yourself to new stuff so much. Oh, okay. That's okay. Great. Thanks for sharing that story. You did great, by the way. Um, why do I advocate exposing yourself to new things? I, I think I recently did a talk on this, that uh, the, the more you expose yourself to new things, the less you have to fear and the less you have to fear, the more things you'll try. And I think, uh, I watched this video and it said that there are only two fears that we're born with in life, the fear of falling and the fear of, fear of loud noises. Like if you're a little baby and there's a crash or a boom sound, it's startling and the baby might cry. And thankfully, we're, we're born with this instinct, this fear of falling because, yeah, you walk across a bridge, you're not going to want to step off of that. You, you will, you'll most likely be severely injured or perish. But the rest of the fears that we have were fears that we inherited from the people who brought us up and they they want to protect us from harm and to ease our suffering and that's generally what they want to do so they tell you things about um don't don't they, they give you all these rules to life like don't talk to strangers like don't take candy from strangers like you guys hear that i mean they don't they probably don't say that much anymore uh, but they used to say, don't take candy from strangers because you're going to get abducted. So now every stranger is a kid, like somebody is going to commit a crime. And then now we have this fear of people. So when we're walking down the street and it's dark, we, we tell ourselves stories that they're going to do harm to us. I mean, there's on one side, it's kind of being naive and, and not paying attention. The other side is being overly vigilant and paranoid. I think somewhere in the middle is probably where you need to be. You kind of just need to be aware of your surroundings, but you don't need to fear every single person that comes in contact with you. And it's like we have unnatural fears of flying, unnatural fears of spiders, because something happened and we tell ourselves this story. Another thing that somebody shared with me recently is children are great observers and horrible interpreters. Like we're really acutely attuned to what's happening. We see things. We see that mom and dad are arguing and then there's just a disagreement. But the story, the interpretation we tell ourselves is it's because we're not good enough, that mom and dad are arguing because of something that we did. And this creates a whole narrative that you keep with you for a really long time and to address these things. So now we're adults and we have freedom, we have choice, and we can do whatever it is we want. But now we're filled with fear everywhere. So no wonder it's natural for a lot of people to be afraid. And the only way I know how to get beyond this is to expose yourself to, most often, an irrational fear. You're afraid of something that isn't real. And I, I think it's one of these, um, these yogis who said fear, I think it's Sadhguru who said this, is fear is a socially acceptable form of insanity. Because oh. we're afraid of things that haven't happened. <clears throat> Like we have a collective agreement that if you're afraid of X, Y, and Z, it's okay. But if if one of us were afraid of purple rooms with uh, snakes coming out of the walls that we know it's not real, we would say, yeah, maybe you need to get checked out. And it's kind of weird how that works. It is really strange. So if you're afraid of public speaking or being visible to people, start public speaking start being in front of people 
And then you'll probably confirm some of your early fears, which is you're not very good at this and that it's uncomfortable. And if you can stick it out, it gets a little less uncomfortable and you start to develop the skills. Here's the thing that I know about myself. I hate feeling stupid. I hate feeling like I'm not capable of doing something. My motivation is to feel less like that, so I have to acquire a new skill. And only by challenging myself, putting myself in those kind of positions, am I able to acquire those new skills. See, because I'm not sitting around on the couch thinking, I'd love to one day learn how to do public speaking and actually be motivated enough to do it. It's that I got this really strong push from my business coach. You need to do public speaking. And I said, okay, I'll do that. So there's a commitment there. I said I was going to do it. Then you volunteer to do one. And then they say yes. And now you start to panic. You start to prepare. And as much preparation as you can have, it's never going to be as good as you think. And actually the pressure that you put on yourself to do well actually makes it worse. But you go out there and you do it and you're terrible. I'm just going to tell you, it's not going to be beautiful. It's not going to be amazing. You're going to be lost for words. You're probably going to sweat. You're probably going to have indigestion. And those are parts of it, part of the process of doing anything that's new and worth doing. And the difficulty of doing that creates natural barriers and resistance for other people not to do it. There are far few, <clears throat> far fewer speakers than there are attendees at a conference. You see that ratio, right? At a conference, it might have 30 speakers and they might have 3,000 people in attendance. And what happens with those barriers that, uh, that are kind of created in the mind is it creates scarcity. Scarcity is what creates value. Gold is only valuable because there's less of it on earth. Oxygen is plentiful. Most of the times you're not paying for it. So trying those things, moving in the direction of your fears is the thing that you absolutely need to do if you want to grow. And, and that's it. It's kind of ironic and beautiful that the only way through it is through it. Well said. Uh, <laughs> I need to, maybe you need to write a pocket full of Misty. <laughs> I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Actually, I have, a, I have yeah. quite a few chapters uh, finished. So my yes. goal is to finish my book this year. Beautiful. Uh, when okay. will you finish it? December. I made a commitment in program there we to go. finish it by December. So There we go. Now you have it committed for a lot more people who are watching. <laughs> right. <laughs> at least Good. at least the 30 or so people are on the pro call here and the 446 people who are watching on YouTube okay, live yeah. with us. I do want to take a moment to thank, I think it's Chanel or Channel Gilcrease uh, for doing the super chat. And he or she is saying, hey, Chris and future family, after finding your content and runs from Flux in December, they're able to uh, start their own business as an identity designer so or pursue their career as an identity designer. So congratulations. Best of luck to you. Woo. Yeah. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> that was an uncoordinated woo. Uh, a little, little late on that one. Okay. Beautiful. Okay. What else should we talk about? R R. What do you, what do you got for us? Jonah, were you going to say something? Oh, I was going to, oh, sorry. I, didn't mean to... I was going to uh, say a question from the YouTube chat, but we can do it. Okay. After. Let's do that. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I want to break it up between the pro and the and the future community. Go ahead. So or, uh, the YouTube. Awais, Awais Shahid asks, how should people start writing and share knowledge who are afraid of plagiarism? Whew. Okay. Lot, lots of things to kind of figure out through that one. And I think that's a very real question. So excellent question. Jonah, good for picking that one up. How do you start? Um, and my wife and I were talking about this. Oh, here we are. Here's where we want to be. The most difficult thing in life is to take that first step. We know if we take that first step, it moves us closer to that goal. But taking that first step is really, really difficult. So the way that we make it easier is we just make the commitment smaller and the challenge smaller. So your first step could be, I'm just going to start tweeting some big ideas I have out into the universe. And then I'm going to write a paragraph. And then I'm going to write three paragraphs and post it on Medium or on LinkedIn. And slowly but surely, you're going to get there. And then you're going to make a commitment to writing some blog post every other day, and then every day. And then before you know it, you could become actually a pretty decent writer. Now, in terms of the question about plagiarism, I mean, everything we do 
believe it or not, is in some form copying things that we've learned from other people. Language, the alphabet, the fonts that we use on our computers, it's borrowed by and made by somebody else. And these ideas keep building and hopefully we add a little bit to it to, to kind of progress the idea forward. I think plagiarism requires a couple of things. It requires intent, intent to steal work without giving credit. And it's hard to prove intention. You need, you need to know in your own mind and your body and your soul and your spirit that your intention is not to defame and steal the honor of other people, but actually to respect and to give credit where credit is due. In the literary world, I believe if you cite, note, and annotate major ideas that you borrow from other people, that's considered a good thing. That's a professional practice. But if you don't annotate, cite, and reference other people, you might get into a little bit of hot water. But I think it's really about your intention. Now, you notice in our book, there's no appendix uh, where we cite everything that we got. It's just too much. I'm not that kind of writer where I have researchers working for me and saying, like, can you figure this thing out? And in fact, we had an editor working with us. I said, I'm not sure where I got this idea from. Can you help me find it? And I'm researching it myself and I can't find it. I know everything I have comes from somebody else. That's for sure. A coach, a teacher, a professor, a video I watch. So I try my best with the purest of intentions to credit where I can remember and as often as I can to help promote those people as, as much as I can. And hopefully we've done an okay job. But at some point, if you go and note every single thing, there would be a footnote and numbers and quotes on everything that you write. Because where do these ideas come from? Mm. So the best thing that you can do, I think, is to honor those people, to, to approach it the correct way, not to try to steal from them, uh, but to also fold in your own stories, your own lens, and add a little bit to the conversation. And then the person coming up after you will do the same. One rule of thumb is this. If you're not sure if what you're doing is going to honor this person, ask yourself if somebody else did this to you once you put in months of work writing your book and they do it to you in the way that you're doing it to others, how would that make you feel? If you're okay with it, probably it's all right. And I just want to use this moment to really quickly clarify something that I see happening a lot on Instagram, that people literally do this. They, they look at people's work, their carousels, and there's credit information at the top and the bottom, you know what they do? They crop it in. So they remove the credit. So you know by cropping in, your intention is not to honor, to cite, to, to annotate. Your intention is to hide the source. And why do you hide the source? You hide the source because you're not a confident person. That people, you fear people will love you less, that respect you less, and, and not give you any credit. Well, your credit is I help to find and curate the best most inspirational content for my audience. And I also honor the people that I'm resharing their work. And the other version of this that we see that I want to caution you away from is to literally take somebody else's story and the way they phrase it and the, their words exactly and to retypeset it and add a new image and not give credit again and not to make it clear. So some people will be very sneaky about this. They'll write a whole long caption and they'll write uh, inspired by. This is not inspired by. This is you just copying and changing it. That's way beyond that. And I've, I've had to respond to some people and they're like, oh, but I'm just learning. Is it okay if I'm just learning? Well, is that really your intention? If you're learning, why are you sharing it? I'm not sharing with you all the homework that I do. Like when I'm in class and all the scraps and the junky things that I do. No, I'm sharing with you the end product of that learning. So this is where you've you've gone way past what I think is that murky middle and you've 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 waded right into the deep end of plagiarism and here's the thing, it's going to come back to bite you in the butt. It really will. That's a shortcut to a short-term career. And the best way I know how to discredit yourself. Do we have more questions on YouTube or? Oh, we can go to RR. Okay, RR, what you got for us? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. 
question is is kind of similar to the last question, except for the plagiarism part. So let's say you were you had an intention, like a long term vision, to write a book. Three, four years from now, what are some things you can do to prepare yourself, and uh, so that you can maximize maximize you know the effectiveness once that time you know comes. Great. Okay. Um, here's what I would recommend doing, and this is something I got from Seth Godin. See, just did it right there. Got this from Seth Godin. He said, today, if you want to be a writer, don't write your book first and then build an audience. You should be building your audience before you write the book because they're going to show up for you and they're going to support you and you need to give value. But also, I think you want to validate the ideas are helpful to people. Not that you need to know if you're good or not, but to make sure that you're being an effective communicator and potentially a teacher. So they go hand in hand. So what you should be doing right now is you should be preparing this audience by writing some version of this book that you plan to write in small bite-sized pieces. And I'll give you the, uh, an example in real in the real world here, what I plan to do. I just said I don't want to write another book, but I'm actually secretly thinking about writing two more books right now. So just thinking, okay, don't, mm -hmm. don't be like, he said it, now he has to do it. No Kickstarter project yet. But I, people who follow me on, on Instagram will see that I write these 10 slide carousel decks. And I've been organizing them in specific categories like mindset, business, marketing, design, and so on and so forth. And then I had this idea, uh, kind of like the way Austin Kleon wrote his books, they're, they're super easy to consume. It's, it's dense with super potent pieces of inspirational content that I can then take the highest performing, best received carousels and take those and make 10 pages of a book out of it. And I would collect the different volumes together and print a series of books and put them together in like a bookcase, a small one, so that you can pull it out and you just want to read about things on marketing or mindset or business, entrepreneurship, etc. You can just pull it out and you can get a mini lesson in 10 pages. And I know it works because think about the attention span of people on Instagram. It's very short. And that you, you could be theoretically standing uh, at an airport or a book stand flip it open and like, oh, wow, that solves a problem I have today. I think that would be really cool if each set of books were designed in different colors. So once you put them together in a slip case, it's going to look really nice, keep them together. But that's one idea. Mm -hmm. So what I've done is I've been breaking down and distributing the workload over long periods of time so that when I have to write, it's not going to be a lot of work and be overwhelming. And I think that's an idea I'd encourage everybody here to think about and try in whatever form that makes the most sense to you. It's like I get to shoot one scene of a movie I plan to make every other day. And when I step back, I collect the best scenes together. I reorder them and make it make sense. And that's my film. If only movies could be made that way, they can't for a lot of different reasons. But I think you can write like that. And I think it's been really cool. So for people who... Who, who enjoy the kind of content that I make, that kind of like the wit and the visual style that I bring to the table, they're going to be able to have this art, gift, entrepreneurship book that you can consume really fast that's really kind of like what I would think is the textbook for the 21st century. Super easy to read, very visual, and, and very potent in the, in the economy of words. So that's what I would recommend, RR. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not on you. It's on us. We're still trying to figure out what the next thing we can talk about. So we've been live streaming now for an hour. I think I'm going to stay on for another 25 minutes or so. So we'll wrap up at 1230, mostly because I'm hungry. That's really all it is. Okay. Uh, Mahi has a question for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, uh, hi, Chris. Hi, Misty. I actually don't have a question. I just wanted to share that uh, just I just bought the audiobook and to be listening to it, uh, by, even while I was working, I was listening to it and yet uh, I could digest everything. And I suddenly realized that um, I have been writing a lot of quotes and things that you uh, say usually. And now it feels like you have presented us with a consolidated copy so that I don't have to search my notes where I have <laughs> what. 
and uh, for some reason i was tearing up uh, while listening to some chapters it was very emotional uh, it reminded me of where i was and how long i have come uh, definitely with with uh, learning from what you have taught and the community the pro group and everything and um, this thing i have here okay i don't think uh, you can see it but yeah it says uh wolves don't lose sleep over the opinions of sheep and it's one of my favorite quotes from the book and i just love it i just wanted to share this with you and i hope that we are able to get the books to india <laughs> and we will see what <laughs> can be done about it i think I eventually we'll have to about. right mm -hmm. yes yes i love the colors thank you very much for sharing and telling me that there are parts there that hit you emotionally cuz that's the greatest reward that I can have cuz like I said I'm a pretty analytical logical cold guy but there is yet a human inside of me that yearns to connect with people on an emotional level and then when I'm able to do in in moments like this I I feel very gratified like yeah you're doing something right kid keep doing it I say kid I'm an old man what am I saying thank you thank you All right, Misty. I don't think any of us think of you as old. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, old's eighty. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, eighty's a so new old. Eighty's <laughs> a new old. Yeah. Yeah. Harris is asking what your preferred manner of organizing your writing is: paper versus apps. Ooh, that's a good question. I think I prefer writing on a piece of paper, but then I realize I'm just making a lot of extra work for myself. So at some point, um, look at this here, I'll grab it right next to me. And this is just some, is a stack of ideas and notes that I've been writing on lots of different things. Every time I have an idea, I put it down on one of these pieces of paper. And underneath that is a box full of these things. And I just keep thinking to myself, when are these going to see light of day? They're not doing anybody any good here. So now I'm like, shoot, I got to get on on an app and start writing for real because then at least I can copy paste and share it quickly with people and eventually it will save me a round of, of typing out my notes. The funny thing is when I write these things, I'm very clear in my mind what the heck I'm talking about, right? You guys have all, this has happened to everybody. You write this little diagram like, oh my God, this is genius. It's going to be so good. A couple days from now, I look at it and I'm like, what was I thinking? Like, how is that even like, what word is that again? And the idea is gone. So I know you. I can't get away with that when I'm on some app. I'm trying to write it. It's like, that's just garbage. Like, I don't even know what that is. Um, so definitely I'm moving more towards digital. And there's a rule that I have is you just type and you don't stop. Typos, grammar, quotations, who cares? When, when you write, you just go for it. I, I think um, it's one of these books I was reading on how to write. And they and writers, professional writers say like you might have an hour or two of good writing a day and that's it. So when it's your time, you write and you don't stop. And when you're done, you're done. Don't even try to force the other six hours. You're done. Go do something else with your life. And, and, and I like that. A lot of the things that I share and tweet on, on, on uh, those social platforms is because I'm having an emotional moment at that moment in time. I'm not just staring at Twitter like, dude, write something, come up with something right now. Make it good. Doesn't happen. And the secret to some of my limited success is this, is responding to comments and questions sometimes gets me really fired up. So when somebody's like, oh, that will never work, Christo. That's so stupid here in whatever country I live in. That'll never work. And that made me write a response, which is, you're right. It'll never work because you don't believe it'll work. So how is it ever gonna succeed? You've already committed to it not working, so of course it won't work for you. Then that makes me think, it's like, why is one set of advice or information gold for one person and garbage to another? It's gold and garbage. The same exact video has helped people to double or triple their income, while the exact same video for somebody else is like, this is garbage and never works. See, that inspires me to capture that thought and to ask that question to, to my audience, to my community, and get to them to start thinking about it. Isn't that strange? We're all surrounded by books. One person will spin it into gold. One person will use it as a doorstop. It's just the way things are. 
Okay, you know what I was thinking, Misty? Uh, I, I'm sorry, I, I think I prematurely cut you off there. Were you going to say something? Not at all. Oh, okay. Here's what I'd love to do. In the remaining time, we have about 20 some odd minutes left here with, with one another. Let's forget talking about the book. Let's just talk about whatever we want to talk about, as we always do in the pro group. Let's do it. Forget about the format and the structure, right? You guys are like on super ace behavior today for whatever reason. I'm not sure why. Yeah. Normally, we're like running around like, woo, let's just do stuff. Let's do it. Let's get so, there. Anybody, you want to talk about anything, open it up. Uh, something that's hot on your mind, something that's uh, burning a hole in your soul. Let's talk about those things. No raising of hands. Should we just jump in? Whatever. If you feel like you got something, let's just have a conversation. If you're in a quiet I, room. I'm with I'm jumping. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not surprised. You want to go ahead. Of jump course. In. Jump in. Okay. So I was thinking, uh, you know, you and I talked about uh, Kairos and this is concept I learned from Costas from inside the pro group. And I was realizing just now, as I heard you speak, that after I started uh, going over my uh, beliefs and changing them because it was not a good mindset, I started hearing you clearer and clearer and it's happening. It's <laughs> and I, I was wondering, uh, I think it's, uh, it's a good idea after, after you understand where you are going wrong with your mindset and how you can improve, then you're going to start hearing and learning as much more as, uh, much more than you ever did before and everything is gonna start clicking mm -hmm. and kairos is it means the opportune moment so i'm i'm experiencing more and more opportune moments mm -hmm. excellent i love your energy today by the way not to say that it's different than your other energy but your energy is very good i like it uh, i just want to just talk about something that's kind of been on my mind recently. I've been recently exposed to Marshall Rosenberg, and he, he is known for uh, a book called Nonviolent Communication. It's a term I've heard before, but I'm like, what does that even mean, nonviolent communication? Why does it even matter, right? And I don't, I don't want to get into all the concepts because I'm, I'm still relatively new to learning the, the principles, but it, it really aligns with something that I believe. And uh, my friend, Annalie, who's on this call today, she's like, you know, I'm not saying you're different, but you're getting better at doing this thing. And I, I was like, that's that's awesome that you say that. And I because I, I think I'm always evolving and changing. So when you say different, it's like different as compared to what? Yeah, uh, three months ago, two months. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm an evolving work in progress and I'm good with that. Here's one thing that really aligns with what I think and perhaps one of the reasons why I've had some of the success that I've had, which is trying to be objective and it's not easy That's to be true. an objective listener to be an objective communicator and to be objective with yourself and what do i mean by that that sounds like yeah you, what are you talking about robot what are you doing here i mean that when we we describe ourselves our progress try to remove language that it sounds judgmental like you're casting judgment on something because who says you're the best judge of anything that's kind of self-important don't you think so marshall talks about this he's like don't tell me i did a good job i don't really want to hear that because who made you the decider of good and if there's good then there's bad right so he said that a young person came up to him after one of his lectures and said, you're, you're amazing and you're inspirational. He says, okay, but tell me what you got from this because that'll help me. And what, what can you apply in your life? That'll help me. That's how I know if I've done a good job, I get to decide, not you. I love that. It's like, now normally when people come up to me, it's like, oh, I love your talk and this and that. Great job, so inspirational. And now I have to rethink like, What's my interaction with them like? Because it makes you hungry and potentially addicted to other people's adulation, right? So when you guys create something on social media, like especially on Instagram, I get this all the time. Nobody loves my posts. Nobody's sharing it, Chris. Ah! Why do you let other people decide if you've done good or not? You know if it's good. You know it's not. And you keep working on it. Yes, some of the feedback helps you to decide I'm connecting with my audience or not. But don't be chasing that. It'll lead to a path of depression. I'm almost sure of that. 
So let's remove judgmental language. Let's remove evaluation and criticism. Let's just try to be very objective. And the reason why I bring this up is because Joanna said many positive things, but she said one thing that caught my ear immediately. She said something about, but not a good one. So the word good is judgment on the one. So I am just a work in progress. I'm not good. I'm not bad. I'm just working on it. That's all. And if you guys can work on that language, the internal language, I think you're going to start to find yourself to be a little happier, a little on edge, less on edge and less um, riding that emotional roller coaster, the high highs and the low lows. I'll tell you a little personal story. I remember having this thought in my late teens. Uh, one character that I always admired on television was Mr. Spock. I love Mr. Spock. He's a Vulcan. He's super logical. He always did what was necessary. And he was very misunderstood and cast as, uh, by his crewmates as cold and uncaring. But you knew that Mr. Spock would, without hesitation, put his life down to save people. And he famously said, I think in Star Trek II, the movie, and the Wrath of Khan, he said, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the one. He just said that, and he said goodbye to his friend Jim, and then he died. Sorry, spoiler alert. Okay, that was it. That was it. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the one. And I thought in my life, being an emotional uh, teenager, just like every teenager, it's like everything is life and death to teenagers. Like, she didn't call me. Ah, my life is over. I wore the wrong pants to school. Everybody will hate me. You know, you ride those roller coaster, and I was starting to think, what a horrible way to live. And on the opposite side is somebody would say something, somebody you admired that you 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 had uh, infatuation, like you were infatuated with this person, and you looked up to them. If they said, good job, I like you, you're cool, it would be like, I'm going to be on cloud nine for a couple hours. Uh, please do not disturb. And it was... It was a it was a horrible place. I would go from like being super happy to like wanting to cry and crying. So I, I made a pact with myself. Look, if I have to give up some of the happiness to get rid of the sadness and the depression, I'm going to do that. So I only want to focus my energies on positive emotions, emotions that empower me. And I'll sacrifice a little bit of that pure, ecstatic, euphoric joy for some of the deep, dark, borderline depression, suicidal thoughts. I'll trade those. So I'm, I'm going to start to narrow this in and become this objective person. And I've been on that path for some 30 plus years now. And it's worked pretty well for me. And now I find out nonviolent communication in this one area, there's some overlap. I, I, I For all the internet people who are going to just hammer me on this because I know there are a lot of smart people who, who watch your channel who's going to say, you don't know nothing about nonviolent communication. I just watched a video like a week ago, so forgive me for that. I'm just trying to share with something with you from my life that's helped me. And if we can eliminate some of that subjective, judgmental, critical language to ourselves and to others, I think there's going to be a lot more peace and harmony. I just want to echo what you're saying about nonviolent communication. It really does help because it's amazing uh, when you stop to start and listen to how you're speaking to others and yourself, mostly to yourself, it, it, it's kind of surprising some of the things that you say. And it's actually a relief to leave those things aside. It's like carrying around a backpack of rocks that weighs 500 pounds. Sometimes you mm -hmm. don't even know it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that term uh, you carry or you bring a lot of baggage is the literal description of an ideal, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of stuff you're carrying around. It's really heavy to, to take that with you everywhere you go. And until we become aware of it, the things that we inherit from our parents, from our culture, from our society and our community, they're not necessarily designed for you specifically or you in the 21st century. And you keep carrying those ideas. At some point, you got to just let them go. I love what Neil deGrasse Tyson says about this. His pursuit as a scientist is to search for objective, verifiable truth and it's not always easy to find, but it's a pursuit worth uh, having and going on. So it's something I think we all need to do. And, and an exercise that we've done inside the pro group is to ask yourself this question. Whatever thought and belief you have, try to make an argument for it and a, an argument against it. 
and let yourself decide based on the evidence and the evidence only what you should believe. Like my son, um, when he was younger, he, he was scared to talk to adults. He really was. So I would ask him, hey, go get dad a refill. Well, then their policy is to get a refill. Uh, to, to, they're, they're happy to do this for you to serve their patrons. I said, dad, I don't want to do that. I'm like, how come, kiddo? He's like, they're not going to want to talk to a kid like me. And he's like probably nine. I'm like, what do you mean? Okay, what's the worst that's going to happen? He tells me, they're going to kill me, dad. <laughs> like, Why would they kill you for asking for a refill? So he had to speak his fear. And I said, let's make all the case for like the whys and the why nots and why it won't happen. You see the irrational, emotional stories that we tell ourselves? Like, he's pretty good at observing, horrible at interpreting. And there he is. His interpretation is, if a kid asks an adult for something, he will be killed. I had to expose him to that. Uh, so, you want to? I exposed him to that. And he went out there and he did it. He took forever to go get that refill. But he came back and he was proud and he was happy and smiling from ear to ear. I said, look, you did it, man. You did it. So now when we're at restaurants and we go out, he's like, dad, I got you your, your, your toothpick, your napkin. Your, yeah, can I, get, uh, I got him a refill for you. It's like, what a different human being. That one little act changed one mindset that it opened up a whole new way of thinking and living and behaving. And then the and next thing is easier too. The next thing is like, easier. oh, I'm afraid yeah. of that. The next thing is easier. Cool. Yeah. And so I, I put my children to torturous kind of things like this all the time. For example, asking for what you want in life. I know. I'm a horrible parent. Report me soon. Right? Just report me. Okay. There's one question here I saw from YouTube. And we're getting towards the end here. So pro people, if you want to get your question out and want to chat with something, get ready. Because we're running out of time. Kelly Elizabeth Notcut asked, Chris, can you talk about how you pivoted the future since the pandemic and the lockdown? Okay, we need to address it. I think almost every live stream we're going to have to talk about this in one form or the other. Let's talk about this. We've made some changes and we're continuing to make changes. I think it's silly not to react to the environment and the stimuli that you're given. Don't just anchor and say and put your head in the sand. Don't do that. So what's happened now? Unfortunately, we have this giant office space that's almost 13,000 square feet that only two people basically work out of, Jonah and Ricky. So they, they basically are, they have the castle to themselves. Yes, sir. And the reason why they're at the office, yep. The reason why they're at the office and not at home is the office is a lot bigger than their apartments. That's it. Otherwise, they can work anywhere they want. The rest of the team is working remotely and we're making that permanent. Not for the next three months, not for the next 12 months, but we're, we're just done. We, we worked through the pain of transitioning and it wasn't that painful because at that point, most of the, the team was working remotely anyways, just checking at the office. We just committed to it. How have we committed to this? Everybody at the office has cleaned out their desks, taken all their personal belongings, and they're all working from home. Well, what have we done? Well, that means that we've c cut out a lot of the time wasted in commuting and in the book, Remote, uh, written by uh, Jason Friedman and David Hansen, uh, they talk about how offices are distraction factories. And it is totally true. And I have to tell you, since the lockdown, I have never been more productive and worked as hard as I have because I realized most of my time was being broken up by meetings. And somebody popping in my office, hey, Chris, hey, Chris, hey, Chris. It's so prevalent that Greg Gunn and I are doing a YouTube or a podcast series called Hey Chris, where he's just going to ask me interruptive questions like that the whole time. So what happens is for me, I go to work around 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock sometimes. I finish 7, 8 o'clock. When I say finish, it means everybody is done talking to me. Now I get to work. And so my best, most productive time is after everybody goes home. So it's going to be anywhere between 8 to 10 p.m. Now imagine taking that very hyperproductive time and stretching it out from the beginning of my day to the end of my day. I have never been more tired in my life. Mentally, I'm just wiped out. And I couldn't figure it out for some time. I was asking my wife, like, God, are you feeling this? She's like, feeling what? I'm like, I'm a zombie. I don't know what's going on. It's because I'm doing 12 hours of concentrated, deep focus work a day. 
and not realize what I've done to myself. So now I take deliberately very long breaks in, in parts of the day when I feel like, you know what, I've done enough work. I'm going to take a break. So my wife will see me like after lunch sitting on the couch watching Netflix. I'm like, what are you doing? I'm like, it's my decompression time right now. And then I go back and then I'm charged to do it. And so I have to learn how to regulate. You notice now I'm not in the studio. I don't I don't look as good as I used to. And now you know how much lighting plays a role in everything. Because the team, their main job is to make me look good. And this is me trying to do it on my own. My lighting here and here. And I'm working on it still, right? So the office is, this is home for me. And this is how we're doing this. Uh, but we've been doing this with the ProFam, I think, since 2014. So we've been at this Zoom game for some time, for all you new Zoomers. So that's some of the changes we've made. We're also changing our office because we don't need to hold on to 12,000, 13,000 square feet. So we're going to be migrating to a smaller part of the building and potentially leasing out the rest of the building. That's the idea for now. That breaks my heart. I don't want to do that. But I also don't want to be stupid about this because I was saving this space to meet and to meet you guys in person and to run workshops and events. But we can't even do that. So it seems pointless. Those are the changes we're making. But otherwise, the company is humming along just fine. Financially speaking, we're exactly where we were last year. So we're on track despite the economy heading into potentially a, a depression. All right. That's good. Uh, Peter Lamb. Uh, Why don't we do this? Question. Yeah. yeah. Let's do Peter. I mean, let's not do him, but let's have Peter speak. <laughs> and then let's have Annalie go next. And then we'll wrap it up with that. All right. <laughs> Peter will not be done on the show. And yikes. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, fire. What's go. up? All right. Cool. How do I know when is the right time to ask for help? Because then when I was a student back in college, I would always be asking for help, right? Without trying to, you know, learn it and research it and do the stuff myself. But now I'm on the other end of the spectrum where I'm just like, no, I think I know what Chris is going to say. He's it, it, going to say this. I should probably just do that. But then I spiral myself to the point where I don't ask any questions, even though I think I'm stuck, right? So when is the right time to figure out this is when I need help? Peter, gosh darn it. That's an excellent question. That's an excellent question because it's a question I've not heard before. So congratulations, winner, winner, chicken dinner. You've done it, my friend. You've asked me a question I've not been asked before. Very good. Okay. Nice. Whew. Uh, this one's tricky, man. It is really tricky. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this in a roundabout way, and let's see if we can get to the answer. I gravitate towards people who are self-starters, who take initiative, who have a great capacity to learn and to figure things out on their own. They're the people I enjoy being around the most because they always bring new things to me and we contribute to each other's learning. I love that. Simultaneously, there are people on my team who make all kinds of weird, dare I say it, not wise decisions <laughs> and they're wasting time and resources. I'm like, why don't you just ask if we had that or if anybody knew how to do this? So there seems to be a balance that there are some common sense things that you should probably start with in terms of understanding that you need to get alignment with the team. For example, if you want to build out a new e-commerce portal and you think our website's going to be improved by that, you probably should ask everybody like, hey, I'm thinking about doing an e-commerce portal. I think we can improve the website. And then somebody's going to chime in and say, look, Peter, we've gone down that path. Don't go down there. It's not helpful to us before you spend all that time and energy, right? Because mm -hmm. we want to be smart before we work hard. So we want to get alignment and clarity on the goals and the purpose and to make sure this is something that we collectively want to do. And once you get there, then go and put it in the energy. I think personally, <clears throat> I find great pleasure, excuse me, <coughs> I find great pleasure in figuring things out. It makes me really, really happy. But at a certain point I get stuck and that's when I need help because the law of diminishing returns kick in. And now I'm spending eight hours trying to figure something out that I know somebody in my circle will have the answer to. A great time to ask for help is to ask to be pointed in the right direction, not how to do something. Mm. Okay? So process that for a second. 
If you want to launch some kind of marketing campaign and you're not quite sure what platform or the general direction, you might want to ask your community, your peers, social media, who has experience in this and what has worked for you. And then they say, you know, this chatbot thing has been killing it for me. I'm in this space and this is how I've worked it. That's usually all the information I need. And then I go down the chatbot uh, hole, the, the chatbot rabbit hole, and I just keep going down there and I'll figure it out. And when I get stuck, I reach out for help. I've done the work. I'll say, look, I've gotten this far. Now I'm hitting this roadblock. Do you have any insight? Oh yeah. You know, Peter, if you uncheck this and click on that option, it, the world will open up to you again. So that's usually where you want to ask for help is to get pointed in the right direction. Awesome. Thank you. That, that was super clear. I okay, got. great. I hope that makes it to be a cut down. Let's do it. All right. Annalie, you get to bring us home. Take us home, please. Hello. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi. Uh, Hi. Yeah, I want to I wanna ask a question about a book, but not okay. this book. Maybe your okay. next Any book. book. I don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I listened to a podcast uh, where you were a guest. I think it called Finding Founders. Oh, podcast. yes. Really? Yes. I really thought good. it was great. Yeah, it was yeah. great. And uh, I heard you talk about like your life and your story. And I thought mm -hmm. it was really emotional and a lot of inspiration. And my thought was like, are you going to write a book about your life? Ooh. Okay, this is where the uh, shoemakers kids have no shoes. The advice I give is not the advice I take. So here we go. My natural gut instinct is answer not for some time, Annalie, because I just don't think my life is that interesting and not that not enough people care to know it right now. I, I believe still that there's more work to be done in terms of teaching the world. And at some point, that story will become more interesting. But I do have ambitions to share this because I, I think... People, people make the wrong assumptions about us all the time. Not that I should care, but they do. Uh, I see this happening on social media. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. Chris has got that silver spoon up his, you know, and he's had everything handed to him and everything was given. And it's like, yeah, that's why he's like X, Y, and Z. And then make up an assumption. Oh, he's never done anything. He's never had to struggle in his life. He doesn't know what it's like to be poor. Boy, don't you know anything, you know? Mm -hmm. So... Yeah. That's that's like why I'm uh, I feel compelled to like you know because people discover you yesterday that's the story that they tell themselves that here they are here you are like we don't we don't know that people like Gary Vaynerchuk has has, mm -hmm. has done what he's had to do to be where he's at we just don't know so yes I would like to tell that story but mostly I I want to tell that story to honor my parents and I don't want to get too deep into this because I don't want to get super emotional but I I do want to say a couple of things. I've have them recorded on tape before I really knew what I was doing and recording them on video, telling the story of how we came to this country and the decisions they had to make. And it is a crazy story that I only started to dip my toes in on uh, for the Finding Founders podcast. But it's a story I want to preserve to help future generations of those like my kids to know where we're from and who we are. And... Um, And, and what their grandparents had to go through. Yeah. I think you can inspire so many people if you tell that story. Yeah, I'll have to wait for like when I can tell that. So, gee, thanks. <laughs> oh, sorry for that question. No, it's all right. Woo, it's getting hot in here all of a sudden. Mm. I don't know what's happened. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll work on that at some point, Annalie. Thank you for reminding me. And eventually, we'll, we'll I'll tell that story. And I think I'm going to wrap up the show. It's it's time to wrap up the show. Misty, thank you very much for prompting me to do this and for playing the role of the moderator for this group. I appreciate that, and I appreciate all the pro fam that's here. Uh, yes, I see the energy there. I I'm so blessed and and thrilled to. To have you as part of my community, as part of my my own support network, and um, I'm 
I'm, I'm grateful for you and uh, I'll show up every day to try to make your lives a little bit better. And thank you, YouTube family, for tuning in today. I think that's it for me. I want to say thank you. First of all, you guys unmute yourself and make a sound or something so people know that you're alive. Yes, thank you very much, you guys. Oh my God. <laughs> Oh, People's <laughs> eardrums are broken right now. Oh, You're busted. You, should, you should start by telling us all those parental uh, nuggets you drop sometimes. They're great. Yeah. You know what? I would love to talk about parenting advice. And that may be my third or 40th career here. And we'll, we'll get into it, Mayo. We'll do that, okay? You guys have an amazing yeah. rest of your Friday or Saturday or whatever time. You can tell our pro fam is super diverse. Men, women gender non-binary all from all parts of the world and, and you can see some it's dark some it's light we just don't know what time it is so it's a super cool group i think one of you yeah. one of you group one of your groups has had a block party today right i, I thought i saw that so yeah. yay yay i wish i could have been there <laughs> uh but okay so that's it for me thank you everybody jonah get us out of here drop some music bye, or something guys. Bye, bye everybody bye. Bye. thank you thank you bye everybody bye <laughs> I, I don't want to hang up. <laughs> <laughs>